Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. This is episode 12, and we have a very special guest, one of my personal heroes, Mr. Robert C. Cooper, writer and executive producer of Stargate SG-1, Stargate Atlantis, Stargate Universe. He's the co-creator, along with Brad Wright, of Stargate Atlantis and Stargate Universe. This man is a legend, and he is responsible for much of what you probably love about the franchise. Uh, the Ancients, the Replicators, the Ori, these are his brain children, brainchilds. These these stories come from him. And, and obviously not every writer is, is in a vacuum. They have the writer's room and everything else to help bring these stories to life. But a lot of Stargate's DNA, right down to the, the DNA that is the the uh, periodic table of the elements in Torment of Tantalus, that, that the nucleus, the idea of communication using protons and electrons, uh, came from this man. And in the next, what is a nearly two-hour interview, we're going to discuss some of those stories. And we're going to really scratch the surface, in my opinion, of of his career with, with Stargate. Um, but what I, pref- what I love about Rob is that he doesn't just glaze over things because he knows that we have a long way to go. He takes time and delves into the reasons why he created a lot of the content that he did. So we got about 70, 60% through the questions that I had originally uh, arrived at for him, but I think you're going to find it much more satisfying. So please click that like button and uh, share this video with uh, other Stargate friends. Uh, it helps the channel grow. The YouTube algorithm is designed so that people who uh, share it and like the video will precipitate it being shown to other Stargate fans who have not actually found the channel yet. So I appreciate that. Let's go in and let's go ahead and, and bring in Rob. I have with me, uh, you might say he's an important Stargate figure. I certainly think so, and his credits certainly say that as well. Mr. Robert C. Cooper, hello, sir, and thank you for being with us. You're welcome. Thanks how, for having me. How are, uh, how are things going? Um, how, what's, what's, what have you been working on through this whole crisis that we've been dealing with? How have you been occupying your time? Um, you know, it's, it's definitely been weird. Uh, I'd say the... Uh, silver lining in all of it if you can if you can uh, sort of find one is that definitely had a lot more family time quality family time and uh, that we wouldn't normally have have had so so been kind of doing that a lot um on the work front i'm um i'm developing you know i i sort of uh came off a project so nothing was uh actually in production or got interrupted by by all this and so i mean it, you know obviously it, it's actually um a good time for writers you can you, you yeah. know you can really focus on on uh on development and on writing I, you know it's not a good time for anyone but um but well, it's you nice do with it with it what you have what you can so yeah in a way it's nice to be able to kind of narrow your world down and and focus on on uh uh you know what you want to write and um so i've been i've been just developing a slate and and getting used to i mean to some extent i used to have to travel a lot i used to have to fly to toronto uh or or la in order to you know feel like i was part of things and take meetings and now it you know people are are a lot more open and in fact insist on on interacting this way um and so i've been doing a lot of uh pitching and, and uh, talking to people through uh, through Zoom. So in some respects, I mean, despite the fact that we've got, you know, to little pixelated cameras to deal with, um, there's there's been a, a net benefit in terms of productivity for you and, and being able to stay, you know, where yeah, the home I mean, front is. You know, without getting into too much of the, the nitty gritty uh, uh, of, of the business side of it, things have slowed down in terms of, um, you know, in terms of development and project acquisition, shall we say, just because there isn't necessarily a clear, a clear pathway to production uh, yet. Um, I think people are very much focused on, 
just putting the things they had going back back into into the stream and and um uh that said you know i've been i've been filling my time with quite a few interesting things so i'm uh i can't complain i was fascinated rob by um the premise of un unspeakable i mean that's pretty heavy and significant uh subject matter did you achieve what you set out to with this story and and well, awareness of the crisis another crisis um i said i i mean the short answer is hell no uh okay. i you know i said from the very beginning it was a very unusual thing to 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 take on a project that ultimately you i knew i would feel like i had failed even from the get-go you know like it and I, I don't i don't mean that the i'm i'm that necessarily disappointed in what the final product is i feel like i have a specifically inside and 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 you know close understanding of of how and why everything comes to be the way it is in the end what i guess i mean is the story was so big and the tragedy was so awful and and uh impactful and and real that there's no way you could possibly uh reflect mm. it in, in eight hours of television mm. um, all all we were trying to do was kind of capture a, a, a little sense of, of of what it felt like to go through it you know mm -hmm. to, to kind of give people an impression that or or really i guess paint a small signpost on the highway <laughs> to a much bigger story and say if you if you want to know a little bit more about something that you should know about here's here's the road here's the path to take and and you know all i think all I really wanted to do was pay tribute to the people who could no longer tell their story um, and and somehow, I think, remind people that this happened. You know? We're talking and about the AIDS crisis to people who are Googling right now and trying about, to figure well, this we're out. We're talking about the AIDS crisis to a smaller, ex, you know, to okay. a smaller extent that, and that's been addressed a lot. And I'm not saying it's enough. It's never enough. It's the same as, mm -hmm. you know, you can never have enough stories about the Holocaust. Uh, this is specifically about the tainted blood scandal that happened in Canada as a result of the, um, the AIDS crisis. And in fact, Tainted Blood is a story that's happened that happened, unfortunately, all over the world. Um, if you just a very quick Google search will tell you uh, that, astonishingly, um, England, the UK is is going through a massive federal inquiry right now about their uh, indiscretions during this this time. Wow. Uh, I mean. 40 to 50 years yeah. too late. Um, it took Canada uh, roughly, you know, 15 years or more to get to a federal inquiry about about what what was done wrong. Um, you know, it's it's amazing to me uh, uh, that that the UK is, is is so behind on this. But but this story happened all over the world. I mean. Um, uh, government officials in France went to went to prison, you know, um, happened in Japan, happened in the US. I mean, the fact is, we, we compare ourselves a lot to the US. Um, and and sort of hold our uh, medical system up, you know, above theirs. Um, but, and, and as awful as as it was there, they were way out in front of it, you know, there, they were, you um, they were ahead of us, and 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 the, a lot of the criticism that we uh, level at our institutions here in Canada for their mishandling of the situation are in direct perspective of 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 how much further uh, you know ahead of us the U.S. was almost two years in recognizing the danger. I mean, you know, for people who don't know or or or, or well, first of all, go go watch Unspeakable. It's on Amazon Prime. I was um, about to plug it. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, but 
and and by the way, please uh, you know please review it once you've seen it. A uh, few a few few more stars on the on the list uh, make it make mm -hmm. it easier to search and find. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it's a uh, if nothing else, I wanted it to be just to bring it back around to the original question. I wanted it to be. Uh, an emotional experience, not a factual experience. People, when we were first talking about it, a lot of people kept referring to it as a documentary. And I kept saying, it's not a documentary. This is not, this is not about the, f it, it is, it is true and, and illuminates the facts of what happened, but it is as much a exploration of uh, the emotional experience of living through something that was not only tragic, but entirely, uh, if not entirely, but mostly preventable. Um, and that's, you know, we see so many common, I mean, it, it's difficult to watch on its own. I think maybe even more difficult now, um, given what we're going through with uh, COVID and, you, and, mm. and, the, and the, the way in which it was been handled in the US and, and you know, the flip has almost happened. And, and frankly, I, you know, I just gave a talk on this at a symposium a medical symposium and and i really believe this has nothing to do with me or my show I, this is really more to do with the true story but i really believe that our response to a, a series of pandemic like situations you know sars and, and ebola and in canada and now covid are are ha, we you know i wouldn't i wouldn't say we've we've been perfect but but we've certainly if we've done a good job at all in some respects, it's because of that DNA that was planted, uh, you know, during the during the tainted blood scandal. I mean, we 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 came of age as a country in in terms of uh, I think learning to hold our institutions to a to a higher standard and 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 take control of our own lives you know medically not that we shouldn't ever trust experts or that you know we we can't uh believe in a system that works but we have to recognize when those systems are are flawed and fix them mm -hmm. and um you know this you know this was people who who have know nothing about it and and then uh dive into it are you know, absolutely shocked at at what happened. I mean, the the blood division of the Canadian Red Cross controlled who controlled blood services at the time, uh, knowingly distributed blood products to users with AIDS in it, and you know, hundreds, and not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds and thousands of people died as a result and and it wasn't even just hiv there was another um virus uh that was in the blood at the time now known as hepatitis c which which infected tens of thousands of more people um so yeah i mean look i i i lived through it um again no secret it's all over the internet that this is in part my story, certainly not exclusively my story, because I, I am very fortunate enough to be here <laughs> today to to tell the story and and you know and talk to you because of, um, you know, certain steps my parents took and, um, and and the work of 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 some people to to kind of change the system. Uh, I, and and then the response of the medical community afterwards, I I, I consider myself incredibly lucky, um, and uh, you know I just hope I just hope that 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 unspeakable sort of uh, touches people and and makes them you know aware of uh, I think the past because because the past informs today and and. Uh, we're seeing that um, kind of in, in full full technicolor right in now. In real time, for sure. Yeah. Unspeakable, eight parts, Amazon Prime. Check yeah. it out. Yeah. Going from that to this, 
to Stargate almost seems trivial. <laughs> that is not. No, look, <laughs> I mean, I look, I, I'm in the midst of selling new projects now. Mm. And I will tell you, I, I mean, for me, coming off Unspeakable, the first thing I felt, at, well, A, is that I would never, I, I knew I would never, uh, I'd never do another show that I, I was the, sort of that obviously personally close. So I don't yeah. want to, I never want to live through another tragedy like no. that, to that extent. Um, and I would never do anything that I kind of cared about in the same way. That doesn't mean I won't, you know, care about another project. But I also was like, I got to do something light and fun. You know, I got to do something. And, and you know, being in the midst of what we're going through right now, it's never been more evident. And I'm, I don't mean to sort of self-inflate what what I'm part of in terms of the industry. But let's face it, uh, people, you know, mental health is, is, is important, too. And people need escape. You know, I, I'm looking for, for things to watch and things to watch with my family. And, and, you know, one of the things we did, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> my kids uh, have not seen a lot of Stargate. Um, they just never really were into it. Um, and, and it's funny, cause I was, I, I'm always battling with my oldest uh, daughter who, who he does, she does, she does like science fiction. So she'll watch, she's seen all of Doctor Who and uh you know she'll, she she watches a lot of that type of genre she watches pretty much any of the new um you know the new netflix uh genre stuff and i'd be like you know there's this other show uh called stargate um which by the way is you know paying for your school right now uh, <laughs> and uh this isn't the one that appeared in season 10. yeah you should uh, they've all, they uh no that one of them but, did well, one of them appeared in an earlier episode as well. Oh, uh, they've both been in it. Yeah, okay. uh, two. I have three kids. Uh, okay. The youngest was um, uh, too young at the time when Stargate was still going on. But yeah, no. Uh, the middle one is in season ten. Yep. She talks about being the um, <laughs> the enemy, the, the enemy messiah, the orisai. Yeah, <laughs> the orisai. Uh, the youngest version is Rob's yeah. daughter. <laughs> yeah. Oh, mother. Uh, Hello, she, mother. Yeah, she still does that line. Oh, um, God. You know the story behind that. We're getting totally off topic. No, here. it's I okay. I was going to say, but but you know the story that, that I did not um, set out to put her in the show. Uh, we hired uh, an actress to play that part. And on the day, um, uh, Will Waring was actually directing the episode. Uh, the actress froze like she just you know it's anytime you're working with kid. kids young, you just don't know right and she just wouldn't move wouldn't say her lines wouldn't do anything and so you know i just said to will let's just move on and we'll figure it out later yeah. it was on it was on a set anyway so it didn't really it didn't really matter that much and um and i went home and i was like i said to my wife you know I think the wardrobe will fit Emma. <laughs> and and so, you know, she just she actually ended up pinch hitting for this kid who uh who unfortunately, you know, had a little stage fright. Yeah. So did you have to pull her out of school the next day or did you wait until school was over? Yeah, and... no, she she got a day off. <laughs> Come and work with daddy. And <laughs> Make actually, a couple bucks. The, the, That's great. The little known fact is that my wife in the episode two, she's it's her hand that that she's the handmaiden yeah actually uh my wife's in an episode she's gonna kill me for for mentioning this, this is years she, later come on she's in an episode she she's uh in space race Who is she in space race there are she plays of... the uh receptionist murray <laughs> that's her i'll be darned okay I think yeah. I knew. I think that that information is out there already. I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, wow. But my There's... oldest is actually in. Uh, uh, God, I can't even. Um, now you're. I should have. I'll, I'll have to look it up. I can't remember the episode. Um, it's a. Uh, it's the episode where uh, there's a bunch of um, uh, bombings in the in the sort of Jaffa world. Um, she plays a sort of a a villager. Okay. Kid. Ah, okay. Is it the one that Christopher Judge talks to? Yeah. 
Okay, so that's Talion. I think that that's near the very end of yeah, the show. Talion, that's it. That's right. Yeah. That's my old daughter. No. Wow. Uh, anyway, my point I was trying to make, <laughs> no, go ahead. Which, which we should circle back to, is uh, we actually sat down uh, to watch a, a Universe. I thought Universe would be something that would be, A, it's a little more digestible. <laughs> it doesn't seem so uh, epic. Uh, uh, you know, just in terms of, of the volume of episodes. Right. Uh, if you're going to do all of one show, that's the one. Yeah. To do. Yeah. So, so, uh, and I also just figured it was, it was something that, that was maybe a little more accessible, you know, with the character of Eli and yeah. Uh, anyway, they loved it. They, we binged it through, uh, Good. Through, the whole, uh, through the sort of lockdown back in, um, um, May, you know, April, May, June. So with the ending, they must have been pissed. <laughs> Dad, we sat through it for that. I the ship is I literally prepped, leaving I, us behind in space. I prepped them for that. Uh, okay. I it I have the hardest universe. I was not the the most I was I was open to it when it started. This is getting hopefully interviews ahead but still i was not the the most enormous fan of it to the be at the beginning something which brad astutely emailed me and pointed out to me um and by the end of it it was my favorite Be well i'm glad to hear you say that i mean it i without a doubt i make no bones about that it just yeah i mean look for me i i don't i don't um it's like you you know they're, they're all our children. So it's kind of hard to, you know, to say one's a favorite over the other. But I, I mean, it, it was in many ways, um, you know, the, for all everything, for everything that SG-1 and Atlantis were. Which I love as well. And was, you as well. Was, you know, it was that when we started, when we first conceived of universe, one of the things I, I came into it feeling was that um, oftentimes with the prior two shows, we would uh, set a target that was beyond our, our capabilities budgetarily. And we would kind of fail to achieve those aspirations and it would show. And, um, and with this, it was, it was the first time I felt we hit the mark, we hit the target that we were going for. And um, for that reason, I feel it was, it was very successful. I, 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 I mean, the other two were, um, I'm not, to say, not saying they weren't mm. character based, mm -hmm. because everybody obviously loved those characters. That's and, why they keep and, coming back. Yeah, and the serialization, you know, was still there, but they were much more, you know, episodic. They were they were case of the week kind of situations, and and the problem we had, uh, I mean, it, it was a, it's, it it sounds wrong to call it a problem because because it was more of a luxury of of having a show run that long, um, but the the issue was we won every week, you know, and and. And it was really hard to maintain the the, the stakes and the sense of, of mm. jeopardy. And, and, you know, everybody laughs about how many times Daniel died and came back to life. And, you know, how how threatening were the Gould eventually? Ball, when... every time we see him, we eventually started killing him. And I made that argument with Cliff Simon. I mean, after, after a while, how long does it take before you feel that your, your character was reduced to caricature? Right. And, and look, Even though and he goes I'm, out in a banging continuum. Yeah, and the shows that I actually enjoy watching on television are shows where the world is small, but the stakes are big for the characters. And you're watching it to, to sort of see who survives and whether they achieve their goals, not save the world. So when you, when you set the bar as save the world every week, and essentially you can't do anything but succeed because without the world, you don't have a show. That's true. Um, it's very hard to sustain that, you know? And I, and I feel like that's one of the problems I have with a lot of the comic book sort of superhero stuff is because you, you don't, 
you know, it's all so predictable. I mean, and then it all comes down to a fight or a battle that you know you're going to win, um, you know, with a couple of obvious exceptions. Uh, yeah. and, and even then, it feels like when they do the opposite and the hero loses, it's simply because they've already won every time and they need to do the opposite. Whereas with shows where the world is small and the characters' stakes are all about them and their world, um, it, you don't know what's going to happen, and 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 the jeopardy is is way up here, you know. Like, I, and that's what I felt we were trying to to do by isolating people, you know, on destiny, and and really make it about the the characters, the challenges, mm -hmm. and the. I mean, people, for you know, I understand it was a very different, yeah, and to some extent, people wanted the same, yeah, uh, and to a great extent, many people. Yeah, uh, but, and, 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 you know, and really, I mean, I think the core criticism we were getting, and, and we were getting it in the other series too, whenever we introduced any conflict between the characters is that people didn't want that. They wanted everybody to be, you know, working together Solve and the happy. Problem. Yeah, solving the problem. And, and you know, to me, uh, look, drama is conflict, right? Drama exactly. is- interaction of people who, ha who are at odds and are presenting challenges for each other. And it's very hard to write a dramatic scene in which everybody's getting along. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's when you, when you're, when you're, you're looking for a hero to believe in, I understand that's challenging when the characters you presented with are flawed, but I also feel like they're, they're much more relatable they much more reflect us and, and reality. And then when they do overcome those challenges and when they do uh, succeed, it's all the more rewarding. I don't uh, mean to belabor universe because I definitely want to get into that later. And people are obviously wanting me to ask you about SG-1 in Atlantis. But it is uh, no surprise to me that you were once again being cutting edge by doing more serialized television. Um, no, but serialized, the one leads to the other, yeah. It's about more serialized television earlier on, in many cases, long before a lot of other people were doing it. I mean- Yeah, it, and I mean, we got, we got, you know- And it's acceptable now. We were always sort of, um, you know, operating alongside Battlestar, you know, just as a function of being on sci-fi and yep. in fact, put us in the same time slot, and so, there was some comparisons and people said, oh, they're just trying to do Battlestar. And, um, you know, that that always felt to me like a lack of recognition of a what we were doing. They weren't watching the show. Um, at least they weren't watching it very closely. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, unfortunately, by the time people realized that it was different and that what we were doing still had the the stargate dna but an evolution of that mm -hmm. um it was it was too late does stargate's lasting popularity surprise you i mean i it's it's one of these evergreen shows that continually get reinterpreted with every lasting generation or every next the, the every following generation and in some cases some episodes are more significant arguably than they were when they were shot yeah, I, I'm uh, one of my one of my little ideas for a, for a lifestyle show that I've I've always wanted to do, but it's it's really not my my area. But um, uh, is is you know how did that become a thing? And 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 the show basically focuses on all of the things that are phenomenon and and kind of delve into the the science or the the sort of story behind how it evolved because there's such a you know, it's so complicated when something uh, happens over a long period of time and then gets to be so big. Why did that happen? You know, and, and how did it happen? Well, it's not, there's no one answer to that. It's, it's a very organic process that sort of evolves over time. It's cumulative. And, yeah, cumulative. And, and I, I mean, am I surprised that it is maintained its popularity not really because there's 
there's a timelessness to good science fiction that um that i think is what is so appealing about the genre um you know to some extent i think you know production values and and the fact that it was a contemporary set piece uh dates it somewhat but but anytime something resonates to the extent or is this is as successful uh to the extent that that it was um you know there's a reason for that i mean i don't there's an underlying you know basis for that that you know you shouldn't be that surprised when when other people come to it and say oh you know that's cool i mean it may not it may not have the same you know the same sort of level of, you know, everything has to be looked at it in, in context of when it was made. And that's true. You know, what was the goal at the time? But, um, but no, and I mean, I think, again, you have circumstances like the, even before the pandemic, we have a shift in how shows are distributed, right? And, and you have the explosion of streamers and the competition and just this unbelievable appetite for content so when you have a show that has 360 or a franchise that has 360 episodes it fills a lot of space on on these um, platforms and so you know uh people are consuming television at a at a rate that i think is so much greater than than it used to be so i'm not I'm not surprised that there's still a world in which, you know, a show that was successful in the past has a new life. Mm -hmm. That's certainly true. I, my, my hope, and it's one of the reasons why I'm doing this now, because the popularity, this, my show, because the, the popularity has not abated. Um, I am a member of several Stargate groups on, on different social media channels. And the fact is that people are constantly logging into those and saying, I've never seen the show before. I'm brand new. Bear with me while I discover these things for the first time. Oh my gosh, that actor in there is the same actor that was in this previous episode here. And all this stuff is unfolding before their eyes. And on one side, you've got people who are like, yeah, why don't you know this? And the rest of us are going, shut up, you know? Let them figure this out. Not everyone's been watching since 1997. You know, yeah. <laughs> I came in in 98, but that's it. So, but it's, I think it's, especially now that the world has at least temporarily stopped spinning uh, and that people are, uh, appear to be discovering this, this show in many cases more than ever uh, now that it's streaming everywhere. I thought it was very important to make uh, a little, uh, corner of YouTube about the oral history of the franchise, and that's that's what we're setting out to do. We're we're in week three when I tape this. This will air on Halloween, and we already have thirty five hundred members, and so something is happening. So I didn't. I'm blown away. So I really appreciate you being here. And what I'd like to do before we proceed any further is I would like to get a little bit into your origins as a person and as a writer and it, it may be a little esoteric but i think in the long in the long run i think it will unspool and and make sense if you wouldn't mind uh telling me a little bit about where you're from and who you were as a young person and how that person evolved into becoming the writer that you are and producer and director that you are now yeah i mean i mean look i all always avoided um talking about this um uh, just because I've, i'm a fairly private person but okay. also again it goes back into the the sort of unspeakable conversation i grew up at a time when you didn't talk about the medical condition that i have because there was a stigma attached to it there was a prejudice that was being directed at the community um because of AIDS and and because of uh, you know what was happening at that time, so so you didn't talk about it, and and that you know in partly why the show is called Unspeakable, mm -hmm. um, and I still have that sort of 
feeling like, you know, I don't, I don't want to share this information, you know, and, and also it came from a, a place of just not wanting to a feel different or special or make it make it feel like I'm somehow entitled, you know, because I'm, I, I have this problem. Um, and I was not like burdening people with it. It was like, I, I grew up not wanting to be uh, different, you know, and, and, uh, but having said that I was born with this, um, genetic disease is called hemophilia. It's a, it's a bleeding disorder. And, you know, I think if I could boil down, you know, the reason, uh, I'm even mentioning this, uh, in it, it, a, it's significance in, in my life is that I, sp I spent a lot of time at hospitals in hospitals and saw not just you know, not just my own experience, but other kids' experiences who are much, much worse off than me. Um, I was introduced to uh, to mortality and to my own mortality. I think in a way that maybe other kids aren't. And and you know to, whether that specifically informed me in my choices about what I did with my life and how I wanted to kind of live or what I wanted to do. I, I, I don't know. I've never been anyone else, but, right. but, but I do feel like um, I always had this sort of sense of urgency to want to do something with, with the time and quality of time that I had. And, um, you know, I, I, my dad, this is, I've told this story and behind the scenes stuff before too. So, to those people who've heard it, forgive me. Uh, I my dad took me to see Jaws when I was seven years old. I don't know what he was thinking. He's a I hate. he was a, he was a smart man. He had a PhD. I don't know. I don't know what was going on there. Um, he wanted to see the movie himself. Well, those of us who love Doppelganger, thank him for it. Proceed, yeah. Please go ahead. He, he uh, anyway, he took me to see that movie, and 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 it was funny because he made me like he knew I was terrified and yet he made me stay for the whole thing because he thought i think in some respects thought if i see the resolution and i see the shark die i'll i won't be as scared but that that had nothing to do with it i, I was i was traumatized for a long time and um but at the same time on some level it it really introduced me to the power of filmmaking and storytelling and what the effect it could have as I laid awake, you know, completely paralyzed with fear. I'm like, wow, that's powerful. Look at what you can do. Um, so I'm, I, that definitely had a major effect on me. And, and, you know, I've, I've always written, you know, when I, when I was six or seven, I used to write, used to draw these comics for my sister was four years younger than me and you know they were serials and she used to beg me for the next episode and they were like <laughs> what a sci-fi you had a fan uh, exactly. it was my, she was my first fan um and uh i recently dug them out of my uh attic and 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 brought them out to my sister and and her her daughter actually was uh hilarious she absolutely loved them uh, they're so super cheesy uh, doesn't matter anyway, they're you no yeah and then uh, I, you know, in, in, in high school, I, I wrote, uh, I, I went to this summer camp um, for most of my uh, teenage years. And eventually when I became staff there, I petitioned, you know, the owner to start a movie making activity as like a, a, an actual position uh, at the camp. And so I would not just sort of run around videotaping stuff, but I would also make movies with the campers as as a, as a, you know, on, that was my job. I was, I was the head of, um, of video and, uh, um, that was, you know, that was super fun. I mean, you'd make basically 20 or 30 little movies, um, a season every, every summer. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, I, that just sort of transitioned into, into going to film school and, and, you know, my mom was never all that thrilled about it. Uh, I ended up taking the LSAT and, and applying and getting into law school and then put it on hold for a year and gave myself a year to see if I could kind of get a job and make a go of it in, in, uh, in the business. And, uh, uh, 
yeah, the next chapter of my life was one I don't love to talk about because even though I started out very young and, and I sort of forgive myself a little bit for the mistakes I made, but you know, I got a job working for a film, for a, a movie company. Uh, I was writing scripts for them for like a ridiculously low amount of money. Um, it was basically indentured labor. Uh, uh, and, I, and, you know, I got some movies made. They are absolutely awful. Um, please do not watch them. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, he says, as he goes to check my eye. I swear to God, my yeah. hands are off the keyboard. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I wish they were like as good as Piranha, you know, and then you, could, <laughs> and then you go, oh, yeah, I can see how James Cameron started oh, and, God. and then moved to this. Oh, I, mean, I see the beginnings of Eli in that character. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Rob, you got to start somewhere, you know. You do, you and but do. you also have to have respect for yourself as well in terms of. And then I've oh, learned, I I've learned this lesson I too, and not letting people take advantage myself. of you. I understand myself. Yeah. It doesn't mean I, you know, I respect uh, the the work that came out of it. <laughs> uh, look, I, I feel like to some extent, you always have to have a healthy perspective, right? If yeah. I, if nobody, nobody continues to have a career if they're if they're too critical of their own work, you're parallel. You get parallels, yeah. right? So you, you have to have a certain amount of ego and a certain amount of belief in what you're doing. Yeah. Cause it's a horrible business. Like, let me, let me just say it's, it's, it's torture. You know, you're, you're, you're getting beaten up all the time. You're getting rejected all the time. And, and there are success obviously along the way that keeps you going and, and, uh, and is, is, is incredibly rewarding when it happens, but, but you don't get to that point if you don't have thick skin. However, you also, you know, need to have a healthy perspective on things or you'll never get better. You know, you'll never uh, grow and, and um, do good work as far as I'm concerned, because, because, you know, I've gotten to the place I, I am through being open to and, and surrounding myself with smart people, listening to what they have to say, um, listening to my mentors and, and hopefully getting better through an examination of what I'm doing wrong. And, and that, that, you know, that, that's important. So, so yeah, even though it sounds like I'm sort of, you know, a little too down on myself, you know, for where I was at the beginning, uh, yeah, I mean, you have to be, you, I still, I would still say I'm, I'm as critical, if not the most critical of my work today um, than anyone else. I just, I'm also not that good at anything else. So I got <laughs> You mentioned mentors. Uh, who are your heroes? Um, both of whom you know uh, personally, but also those that you watched and studied. Um, I mean, the, my, I grew up during, you know, the birth of the blockbuster and, and Spielberg and Lucas and Scorsese, um, Cameron. I mean, look, I'm a fan of all those, those guys. I've actually recently been rewatching a lot of the John Hughes movies with my kids. Mm. I mean, I'm a huge fan of that world. Um, uh, William Goldman was a big influence on me as a writer. Uh, I once, I was once teaching uh, a boot camp at a postgraduate screenwriting uh, school in Toronto, and they run a, a television division and a film division. And I was teaching this group of students, you know, in the television on the television side, mm -hmm. and in the next room is William Goldman talking to the film people and you know a whole bunch of extra people had come and the whole time we're doing our little workshop you can hear this raucous laughter going on next door and and everybody's kind of like sort of looking over at the wall right and i had to stop and say all right look if you guys just want to go listen do you want to go I, I understand i do too i don't want to be here with me <laughs> <laughs> oh 
Uh, I want to be next door listening to him. I mean, yeah, I, I, uh, I, there are people, look, there are obviously people who I admire, but then I also, uh, I'm, I don't, I don't always put everybody up on a pedestal either. Like I, I, I examine their work. I look at what's successful about it and, and also look at what I don't like about it. And yeah, not and, everything's a home run. No, no, so. no. I mean, look, it's a, it's an art form, right? Yeah. Like, and, and we, and we also, you know, live at the intersection between, you know, art and commerce and something happens in, in that, in that collision as well that affects everything. And, and so, you know, I, I just, I consider myself kind of a student of, um, uh, of filmmaking and, and screenwriting. And, and I appreciate those who have been, uh, successful over a long period of time. Uh, I mean, writing wise, I'm a huge fan of, uh, Richard Price and, uh, David Simon and Aaron Sorkin. And, uh, there are, there are, you know, so many of these kind of pillars of, um, uh, of the business that are, are, are up there for a reason. Um, I mean, in real life, I mean, I, I, I owe a huge, uh, nod to, to Brad and Jonathan, who kind of gave me the opportunity to, uh, be a part of Stargate in the first place. Um, you know, and, and, and I learned, uh, from them how to, how to produce and how to, how to make the most of what we had. I mean, that there's so many examples along the way. I was sort of going back through the show last night, pre preparing a little bit for tonight, for today. And, and uh, just thinking about all the sort of the story, like, you know, you, you have a way of coming at things from entirely a story perspective, but there's so many times when, um, you know, producing was was what came first and it was how we achieved what we did it was how we kind of got the production value with the resources that we had so there are definitely things that were that happened more because this set was available or this you know beautiful big prop was available um and we were like we got to find a story to tell about mm -hmm. that wasn't the blade set uh it folded well, into Atlantis many, for like one dollar or something. Well, that was a case of, of 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 that particular thing being available and us figuring out how how do we retrofit this? Like how do we you know that's different than that's sort of looking at what's around. We would do mm -hmm. that too. We would say, look, we need this giant set. Is there something we can use to build on? Um, but yeah, I mean, look, there's just so many versions of stories in which you know hey this happens to be like we you know uh, uh small victories we we had a our our i don't remember who it was originally that said so but it might have been our our location manager it could have been martin wood was like hey there's a decommissioned submarine in the harbor that's in, right you know, in vancouver let's go check it out maybe we should shoot on it we all went and scouted it and was like we have to find a way to tell a story on this thing. What are we going to do? And, you know, um, that's how stuff like that came about. It was like, how do we, how do we get cool production value from something that happens to be there for us? And, and just a little nugget like that unfolded a huge political plot development through the rest of SG1. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, and yeah. And, you know, you, you, you'll ask me, well, how did this idea come about or how did that idea come about? And, and the truth is when you're making, you know, 20 episodes a year for a long time of a show, you, you kind of take anything you can find in terms of threats, you know, little pieces of stories that, that you can fold in or bring together or, um, really kind of, uh, take advantage of uh, you know brad we used to uh we used to get the studio would come to us a lot about um doing uh extra material and shooting like little web series and like when that started to become you know popular thing. yeah yeah thing you know and and <laughs> and they used to ask us you know to to write that that stuff and 
And Brad used to say, if I have a good idea, it's going in the show. <laughs> you know, I, I want to, I, we only, there's only a certain number of good ideas out there. And mm -hmm. by, by the episode 200 or so, we were like trying to come up with stuff that we hadn't done before. Um, and on that season and uh, those surrounding it, 40 hours of television per year. Oh yeah, you don't have to remind me. I, I still can't believe it's one of those things that I, I just, don't know how I, you did it. I can't believe we did it. Um, but uh, you know, I was I was recently reminded uh, of going back through some some family photos and some stuff with the kids by my wife that I really wasn't around very much at that time. <laughs> you know, it's like oh yeah, right. We were making forty episodes of TV mm -hmm. a year. Was that, did that, I'm, I don't want to get too personal, obviously, but, um, you know, was, did that make it, was that difficult? I mean, uh, I grew I up, mean, my dad was often gone my, himself, so. I mean, I wasn't gone, I wasn't completely out of my kid's life. Right. I, I certainly tried to be there as much as I could, and it was very important to me. Um, uh, and, you know, having, having kids is a, is a challenge, period, you know, like the, the, the that's a, it's a, uh full-time job um and my wife did an, a, an unbelievable job uh she's always been incredibly understanding she you know her family's in the business as well so i think she kind of okay. knew what she was getting into and okay. and uh uh you know saw the the sort of success i was having and and was a part of it so i don't yeah it was never there was never uh any sort of serious tension over it. And, and I, and I feel like I was, you know, so I, I actually, um, I think the single greatest, uh, achievement of my, of my, uh, filmmaking career are the videos I've made of my kids. I, <laughs> I, I, it's no joke. I, I, would make uh, several of them every at the end of every year. I would videotape them over the course of the year, and uh -huh. then I would put them together as like little music video videos. And at this point, I think I'm up to about ninety. So when people are like, I we invite people over, and they're like, "Oh, do you have some you know stuff of the kids?" I'm like, "Oh, oh, oh do I? <laughs> you want to sit down and watch about six hours of it?" Um, the kids must be dad. Another one. Come on. Oh, they love just, it. Oh, they, they do. No, oh. they love it. They sit a couple times a year. They'll sit down without any prompting and just watch the stuff of themselves. And and it's funny because they that's their life. It's like, you know, this is that's their life. Great. Right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I honestly believe. And, you know, because it's it's a it's a history, a visual history of, of a whole bunch of people who aren't with us anymore. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just times in their lives that that they will never get back. And I think having that. Um, that archive in a way is, uh, is very special. I honestly Fantastic. believe it probably the best work I've ever done. That's great. Well, they're an extension of you, you know, the, yeah. they, the kids and they, the, the, the product, you know, the, the, yeah. the film that you shot. So that makes sense. The Stargate feature film. Did you see it in the theaters? What were your yeah. uh, reactions to it? And how did that lead to working with Brad and Jonathan? Um, I, yeah, I mean, look, I did not, I, 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 re, I remember seeing it in the theater. I don't remember walking out and thinking it was the greatest movie I'd ever seen. Uh, it was definitely uh, inventive and the Stargate itself was a phenomenal um, uh, tool, a creation. Like it was, it was a doorway and it was a way to tell stories. Um, you know, when I, I was not, was I surprised when I heard they were going to turn it into a television show? No, not at all. I mean, I felt like that, that there was definitely, you know, the, the foundation there. Uh, I was working on another show. Uh, it was my first real gig on a TV series. Um, it was called Sci Factor uh, Chronicles of the Paranormal with um, Dan Aykroyd was the host. It was a sort of uh, recreation of, you know, dramatic recreations of paranormal encounters. So rescue nine one one for Sci Factor. Yeah, I mean, look, I think there's there's actual paranormal, you know, investigative recreation shows on now that are yeah. that 
I guess we were we were part of the the beginnings of. Um, I had a, a sort of a short lived uh, uh, experience on that, and and got a call from my agent that that they were doing this show in Vancouver, and I I actually and Brad would would tell you that one of the things he was sort of most impressed with was the fact that I chose to, you know, use my, my mileage points and fly myself out to Vancouver um, for the interview, because I firmly believe, and I mean, again, here we are talking to each other this way, that there's a disconnect, you know, over the phone and, and, uh, you can read a room when you're sitting there with someone and you can kind of convey passion or, uh, you know, I think pivot and, and, you know, dance a little better when you, when you can read somebody. Completely. Um, yeah. And in fact, it didn't go that well. Um, John, Jonathan was sitting behind his desk and he had a pad of paper and a pen and he was like poised to write down any good ideas that I had pitched. And I pitched a bunch of stuff and the pen never moved. And the more I talked and the more he sat there with that pen never moving, the more sort of, you know, self-conscious. Yeah, and it's getting flop worse. Sweat, flop yeah. sweat appeared. And I ended up, I had like a bunch of detailed ideas and then some paragraphs and then on the plane, I had written down these sort of one line flyers, like, what about this, you know? I had gotten down to that place and just pitched something like, you know, what about this sort of apocalypse now kind of thing? And that he wrote down. And I saw like, I saw the pen move. Uh, and then I ended up, Brad took me on this tour of, uh, they were shooting the Outer Limits at the time. Yeah. So he showed me the facility and what what they were building a studio specifically for Stargate. Um, and, uh, you know, MGM kind of ruled the bridge studios at that time. They had several shows going. Uh, and Brad and I talked about, you know, he asked me if I played golf and I was like, yeah. I was like, yes. Note to self, take golf lessons. Um, <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> you no, haven't started I, I, yet. I, I, I played, but not 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 that well. Oh, uh, golf is the cornerstone of Stargate in many respects. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, I you know, <laughs> I wrote that that episode and and there were a couple of things about it that I, I don't I don't love that episode. Which episode is that? First commandment. The first commandment. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that is kind of apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah, the Jeez, first, man. Hello. Yeah, there's a look. The first season was challenging in yeah. many ways, and and uh, and, and it, you know, I was I was thinking about it the other day because I I noticed um, Dan Levy was talking about Schitt's Creek and the fact mm -hmm. that no way that show gets to where it is if it hadn't been allowed to live and breathe for a number That's of true. seasons. You know, in any other circumstance, maybe it gets canceled in the first year, which is where we're at now. Like things just get get canceled. If all they're the not time. stellar. Yeah. And sometimes even then. And Stargate, you know, was gifted with a business plan that was, a, you know, a, a 48 episode order to start with. And then uh, another 48 episodes within the first season. So it was like four seasons right from the get-go or 40 it was 44 sorry yeah 44 yeah. and then another 44 so 22 episodes times four within the first season so you had a place to sort of explore and and you could fail and trip and get up again and and uh and figure out what the show was and and build that audience um it it you needed that i mean uh so i didn't first commandment was uh it was interesting because I think it was a stepping stone uh, with Brad and, and John as well in my own sort of career on Stargate because the first draft was very different from what, what was shot. Uh, I think they were impressed uh, with what I had managed to turn around in the time I, was, I had, but I had a meeting with them. Um, they had flown me out 
uh, based on the on the uh, first draft, sort of given me a, a very small uh, sort of option period. So it was like, we'll try them out, <laughs> but we can pull the shoot real quickly if we need to. Um, and uh, they, I remember having this meeting in John's office and they both had this look on their face. And I was like thinking, what are they, what is the, what are they going to tell me? Like, what is it I've done wrong? And how, how am I going to fix it? Like my mind was already racing. And, and they basically pitched me an idea. Um, it was not like the, the, the character in the story uh, who was, a, you know, a sort of romantically attached to the sort of a, Kurt's character in the story was not Carter. And that was their pitch to me was how to, can we make this Carter? And, and really it meant I had to completely rewrite the script. It was going to be a page one rewrite. And I just went, sure. Yeah, that's a great idea. And I went away and I did it and came back and the script was better. And I mean, I don't, I still, again, I don't think it was great. I actually, in retrospect, I wonder about making it Carter. Uh, yeah. her, but, Jonas was her her ex, fian right, ex fiance, right. her ex husband. Yeah, fiance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, uh, anyway, they 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 really, I think, respected the way I handled that and the way I delivered the final product. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, then it then it became about well. What, what next right like the whole thing and i and i really i say this to writers all the time young writers who 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 i'm working with or or you know when i'm doing you know seminars or or teaching scenarios i'm like you're not about your idea you know like mm. it's not like i have the great idea or someone else took my idea or here's the script that's gonna be the overnight you know, million dollar sale and <laughs> you're building yourself. You're the product. You are, you are a writer. The stuff that comes out of you is a, is the product that kind of goes out into the world and, 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 you know, you, but you, you are the product. You are what your agent is going to sell. You're going to get a job and you're going to work on that job. You know, it's like, yeah, the material is important. The right you have to have something to say because that's going to inform the quality of your material and sort of elevate it. But you don't live, ever live or die on one script. And and you know, I remember when Joe and Paul first uh, came on the scene and sort of pitched us. They the one of the things that impressed we we were there was no one idea that we were like, oh my god, that that's the perfect Stargate idea. It was more that they presented these really clean, simple, uh, concise story pitches in, in a beautiful format. They were all good ideas. I mean, they all sort of, for whatever reason, they had little things about them that worked or didn't work, but right. they were writers. You could tell they were writers. And, and it, that's, I guess my point is it's not always about the idea. So, so after, and again, you know, with Brad and Jonathan, it's like, great, he wrote one script, it's okay. And then moving on, what else has he got? You know, and I knew that my job in a way kind of hung on, well, what's next? And uh, I, was, I was talking to, I was in the car with my wife, who um, to this day still takes credit for um, Torment of Tantalus. Uh, <laughs> Cause we're driving and I'm saying that to her, I'm saying, look, I, you know, you're only as good as whatever you've done for me lately. And, uh, and I said, it's, you know, I, now I need to pitch something else. And I had already, like I said, I had exhausted that long list and gotten down to the bare bones before right. I found what they, they really liked. So I'm like, I need something. I don't know what, I don't know what to write next. And, and she said, well, what about something in the past? And to, you know, that's what she said. That's it. She totally, she's like, she wants, you know, full co-writing credit on Torment. That's what she said. But, you know, that literally twigged the idea for me. I, I was like, well, uh, you know, what about Catherine? What, you know, what, what is her story from the movie? She was something that was never addressed in, in the pilot of, of, of SG-1 or any of the stories. And, and I said, maybe there's a, a way of bringing that all back. Um, 
And, and so that was how the sort of seed of, of, and I, and I remember when I came in and pitched that to Brad and Jonathan, uh, I, 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 I don't, I can't, you'd have to ask them, but I kind of got the feeling from the way they reacted that that's when I left the office, that's when they called the studio to pick up my option and, and sign me, <laughs> sign me up for the rest of the season. Cause they're like, Oh, okay. I think this guy should stick around. Well, before we get into torment, I think one of the things that that's so significant significant about what you did with First Commandment is the characters are almost fully formed in that the the small character beats between each of the characters, their relationship with one another, um, is working, and that propelled itself throughout the rest of of the franchise and and what you did later. So I think that 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 played a pretty significant role. Then when you get into Torment of Tantalus, you end up creating. I don't know how much of it was you and how much of it was was the group and the writers room together. What became the foundation for the mythology for the rest of the show? Not just bringing back in Catherine and introducing Ernest, but I mean it's something that people still talk about to this day. You know, if we're going to do another show, what about you know the fall of the four great races? You know, it's constantly percolating in fans' heads, and there's a reason right. for that. The material it was a great idea. I I. Yeah, I was always looking for, um, in a way, things that had been introduced in the movie or ideas that Brad and Jonathan had sort of teased in the pilot um, that could could expand the mythology. You know, I, I certainly brought some new ideas into the mix as the show went on, but part of it was just saying, okay, you know, here's a question or a plot hole, frankly, that we can fill with this answer. And, and um, you know, I think there's a, uh, you can get too um, buried in backstory that's mm. irrelevant uh, at times, you know, writing and shows kind of fall into that trap. Mm. Um, what's important is how does it move the story forward? What is it, what does the, what does the history, the history informs the show and gives us a richness and, feeling as though there was this past and world that came that came before what we're seeing but then how does it propel us forward how does it move us towards new and interesting stories and 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 you know lead us to something so that was like that's the perfect marriage is to say here's the history you know here's the present and then how are those clues that we get gonna gonna move us forward and the show look the show was about history too right it was about this you know learning about the unpacking of how this alien race had kidnapped people from various times in history and um so we were almost you know archaeologists going to these other planets to discover stuff about ourselves that that, that was sort of built in uh and 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 one of the things i i kind of loved about um about the show so so yeah i mean uh I, you know, one, if I was going to pat myself on the back, um, I think one of the ideas uh, I'm most proud of in the history of Stargate was the idea of using um, the periodic table and uh, as a, as a, as a code. Um, and I thought that was uh, pretty cool. I'm walking, I'm going through the entire franchise right now and uh, this is something that I'll share with you when I'm done, but I've got a long way to go. <laughs> and I'm taking each episode and I am distilling it into each episode into what I think the message was. What what the message was for that episode. Two or three messages in a single episode, sometimes four, you know, like heroes. I look at the heroes, you know, one and two as several layers of themes and like what I walk away with. And I'm at season three of SG-1 right now, but for Torment of Tantalus, the first thing that I wrote um, that I gleaned from the show, because I'm using this as benchmarks as I go through the show uh, and episodes with the writers and the creators as like my starting places. But for Torment of Tantalus, I just wrote, communication is in our DNA. Now that's, that's a core tenant of I think what you were trying to establish. When you reduce, when you reduce communication to its most basic elements, 
Um, that's what Torment of Tantalus was presenting to us with that, with that hologram and that we as people are naturally inclined to determine how to, to, to try to work with one another and work with beings that are beyond us and unlike us. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I look at it as when you have people who are different, um, which is a, or appear to be different, which is a somewhat relevant topic. Mm -hmm. um, where's the commonality? And the, and the truth is, it's the commonality is far greater than the difference, right? Like that's, that's what I come to is, is we're all the same. We're all made of the same stuff. We're all stardust. And the same protons and electrons, you know, like, right. it, it's like, get over yourself. You know, it's all carbon. And, and uh, so that was, that was the, the essence of the idea was, was at the, you know, if you have the, these four very diverse specific you know, uh, races, you know, communicating with each other using the most universal commonality. Did, uh, whose idea was it that the Goulds did not create the Stargate network? Torment of Tantalus is, is the first episode that suggests that Ra and his race did not create them. And in the movie, uh, we're led to believe that they were, which is typical Gould for you. Yeah, that, that, I know it wasn't me. I, I'm going to, I'm going to say, I believe that that was in the sort of pitch documents, uh, Bible that Brad Jonathan wrote. I mean, I think, uh, the idea of the ancients, um, uh, being being the creators of this this sort of that that the that the gold were just um, hijacking you know a pre existing network they're scavengers uh, yeah they're hackers uh, yeah yeah scavengers yeah. yeah was 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 in their original pilot concept how early on did you or the others um, or a combination of both because nothing happens in a vacuum you guys had the writers room. How early on did you know you wanted to make the ancients a previous evolution of humanity? I, yeah, I don't, I don't really remember exactly. This is one of those things that was a, a fairly organic evolution where things built, you know, like it, it was, it, it started with maternal instinct. I think that the, mm. there was this notion of first seeing these, these beings who had a higher power. And then, uh, yeah, I don't remember the exact episode where that sort of light bulb went off. I'm pretty sure the conversation started around uh, Ascension. Season uh, five. Yeah, but it wasn't, I, I mean, we, I mean, I don't, I, you could probably tell me when the actual revelation was made on screen. I don't it's full remember. circle. In full circle. Yeah, Daniel's looking yeah. at the tablet and he says, I'm an ancient. Right. <laughs> yeah. That was a big and, deal. Yeah. And and so yeah, I think I, I had been doing some reading and 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 it was sort of very interesting to me. Actually, that's there was there's the the um there was more talk of it in the ice episode too, right? Uh, where... uh, frozen. Yes. yes, season six. Yes, there season was six. Frozen was the Frozen. Ayana. Yeah, that was the time. That was the that was this episode where I sort of I think sold the idea in the room. Okay, and did the Nox get folded into the the four great races mythology only at the point of the fifth race when the Asgard mentioned them, or were they involved percolating in the back of your mind during around the time of Torment of Tantalus? Production, yeah, because we had just we, seen them. Yeah, we talked about it um, around torment. I mean, one of the things I think Brad and John were were really good at was um, the long game. And I mean, it's obvious in in the in in the longevity of the show that that you don't want to give away too much too soon. You don't want to you don't always even want to commit to something until you're sure it's a good idea that you want to pursue so that's why we didn't 
really identify those four races in torment. It was like, we could have said at that point, it's this people, this, these people, these people, it, it was more, let's, let's, let's leave it as a mystery and let's figure out the best way to solve that mystery as we go. Um, and some of that came from the confidence of knowing we had the road ahead. Um, and, and some of it was just good instincts of uh, good storytelling instincts. Mm -hmm. People are probably trying. Mystery is, you know, partly why you keep watching, right? No, absolutely. And it's, it, it's a huge reason for coming back for more because, you know, it's sooner at some point or another, you're going to hopefully uh, unbox that in front of us. Um, right. I, I'm starting to move through a little bit more of the content right now because I have a huge list of stuff that I'm not going to be able but, to. I mean, look, I guess also, you know, when we talk about the, the success of the show as a whole, I mean, again, this is patting myself and the other writers on the back uh, a little here. But if anything, the I think the hardcore fans would would agree that one of the reasons the show paid off all those you know threads was because it was there was continuity in you know behind the scenes creatively so there you know if if, if they had if we had walked away or they had you know decided to change the creative uh uh you know people behind the show and they brought in new showrunners and new writers there's always that sort of i think there might be some respect for what came before, but there's always that sort of motivation to want to put your own stamp on it and move in a yeah, new direction. Yeah, they want to do their thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the fact that we continue to to kind of develop the mythology respectfully and and push it in new directions, but at the same time tie up old threads and bring things together from the past, you, you know, the the diehard fans were rewarded, you know, or felt respected, and that they there was some value in them kind of cherishing those moments and studying those things and 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 so, see it all come together. Whereas if there hadn't been that continuity creatively over the whole franchise, I don't think you would have seen that. Mm. Yeah, the it's just the tapestry is enormous, you know, and I think I think it comes down to the the good the the good seeds that were planted at the very beginning. And you know, obviously not everything sticks. The Ritu, for Pete's sake. You know, there are little things that just, you know, for a visual effects budget or whatever, you know, just didn't necessarily had to move on. So sure. uh, in season two, we really get the power that is the Asgard. They come away, they come and wipe out Harrower's camp in, in Thor's Chariot, for instance. By season three, in an episode called Fair Game, Thor reveals to us that, you know, we may be all powerful, but we can't come to your rescue, you know, when necessarily when the Goa will, you know, come knocking for Earth again. We have our own problems to deal with, and they are far worse. And I remember Daniel's reactions like, worse? There's another race out there that's worse. What inspired the replicators? Um, so first of all, one of the pitfalls of uh, you know a science fiction show in general, and this was sort of this is a rule I always sort of took with me and 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 advised other writers about, and that is, and you know, you can almost see the same problem. I don't know if you'd call it a problem because it's certainly very successful, but you know, the Marvel universe had this, this phenomenon play out in it too, is that, is that in order to escalate that battle of save the world and your, your bad guys continually get more and more powerful. And, and part of the problem we had was, you know, the Gould were so powerful, um, yeah, and and then and then the Asgard came in, and they were even more powerful. Like they just seemed almost magical in terms of their godlike power. How do you how do you rationalize them? Not just like I again, I had this problem with Superman. I mean, I don't understand why Superman ever had a problem, you know, dealing with anybody. He he he, he seemed godlike, and yeah, just go around the world and you know go yeah, back in time yeah, and solve it. Yeah, exactly. So. There's always a danger in making your bad guys or your good guys too powerful. And uh, 
And so that was, that was the immediate problem that I felt needed to be solved in fair game is why doesn't Thor just come save the day all the time? And, you know, it's kind of the Q phenomenon in, in, in next generation, yeah. right? You know, it's like, why, if you have this magic power, why not just fix it all the time? Yeah. Uh, and it, and I didn't like the fact that in that situation, it seemed to come down to a personality quirk, right? Like, it's like, I just don't want to, and, or you have to beg me, or it comes down to my ego. It felt that feels like the writer is just, frankly, you know, being a puppet master, sidestepping right? the issue. Yeah, and so I, I, to me, that was a big problem with the Thor mythology was that he was, he and the Asgard were were frankly too powerful and and needed a kryptonite, you know, needed some explanation for for why they couldn't just come, you know, deal with uh with the gold and so so it was it was about okay well what are they dealing with what what is the what is the weakness or the or the war they're fighting on on another front and uh you know look i i think at the time the terminator would have been an inspiration for me or or the borg i think had just had just come out uh, there was an episode of that and i i, I love the idea of um of a of a villain you couldn't negotiate with it, there was no uh mind games <laughs> you know you were playing it wasn't about uh it wasn't about that and 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 i also you know i love the idea of uh you know creating essentially the science fiction version of cockroaches that just right were were prolific and and they were you know just when you thought you had gotten rid of them more more showed up and you're dealing with a virus you're dealing with something that yeah. that yeah. by its nature all it does is consumes and makes more and does, yeah it doesn't care doesn't it isn't it isn't a, you know it, it isn't uh emotional in any way and uh, uh so you can't appeal to it <laughs> you know logically or emotionally um yeah, and, and, and also, frankly, um, one of the things we talked about a lot in the writer's room was the sort of understandable, but at the same time, moral questionable aspect of m mowing down Jaffa, <laughs> you know, all the time. I mean, they were... It's true. Oh, kind of subjugated. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily. I wouldn't call them innocents, but but they they were the pawns. They were, well, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, they were they were living, breathing things, and you know, it it becomes about that. And look, it's an interesting, dramatic thing. The question of 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 killing the enemy in war. I mean, what is what are they? There was something uh, more sort of video game fun and and not at all uh morally questionable about just how you know shooting replicators eh? who's your daddy <laughs> like Rick does. you could really wholeheartedly uh, enjoy as he does that, that process yeah like <laughs> you know th there's a there's a guilt that comes with with killing another being despite the fact that they might have killed you um there's on some level you're like well maybe i could have just worked it out uh but with this it's like no, no no you have no choice but to shoot them all and 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 that was kind of a, a um you know a lot of fun so with that in mind one of my favorite uh cornerstones of this franchise is the idea of transcendence and moving on to another plane of existence. And I and I think you'd probably agree that, you know, once you've been around for a certain amount of time on one plane and you've you've accumulated so much knowledge and understanding and and it, it, there's nowhere else to go but up in a manner of speaking. How did ascension not the episode but the idea uh, become a thing? And how that's where the ancients ultimately went? Um, well, we needed to answer that question to some extent, you know, we wanted to know what happened to them. Um, 
I think that we look a lot of Stargate was a uh, not anti-God, but anti-religious, yeah. you know, doctrine. You know, it was about how re- the, the worst aspects of religion allowed those, you know, humans or aliens in power to to subjugate people to to mistreat them or 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 you know and i like how you clarify that not just religion for religion's sake but the worst aspects of it that drive us to yeah i mean there's something and... i understand i understand traditions i understand you know some you know seeking a uh meaning through through uh writing you know through stories whether you consider them to be mythology or not or or truth I, I you know that's that's your choice but but uh but you know let's face it religion has been used uh to to do some pretty awful things and uh in 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 reality uh and you know and 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 that's what the show was about it was about false gods you know uh you know enslaving people and 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 i think the while i'm i don't i don't i'm not saying that the ancient storyline was was a sort of meant to be a any sort of proof of of a higher you know power or being it was more of a of a, a just an antidote to the negative aspects of the use of religion in the show, it was about how, frankly, you know, spirituality or, or the, the sort of desire to reach a uh, better state of being, whether, you know, you, whether that exists as, you know, in the mortal world or not, um, was a, you know, an idea worth exploring. I, I don't, I, I feel like it, it was sort of, uh, we you could you could too often focus too much on the negative side mm. of it and I think maternal instinct was about you know the beginnings of trying to show that there was another side of the coin out there you know and that we weren't all one negative note in terms of what religion was um and, I, and it's wrong to almost say religion i think it's more about you know spirituality because because you know you can look at at things like Buddhism and say, look, there are tenets of that that aren't even necessarily. I mean, I guess it is religion. We're talking about semantics here, but um, and maybe people will be mad at me. But I do think there's, I think there's, you know, mindfulness and meditation and all those things can exist without without God, you mm-hmm. know, and 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 how those can be beneficial to you personally, individually, uh, you know, in the context of your life and, and how you can use it from a storytelling point of view. Um, that's, I mean, I mean, we're, you will eventually, I guess, in the course of the conversation, get to the or, or I, but, but that's what, that was the seed of that is like, yeah. what is the, you know, what else is going on out there? Um, and if there are, um, you know, if the Gould are one version of uh, impersonators, in this case of, of religious icons, um, are there beings out there that are just advanced and powerful enough that to us appear to be uh, God-like, you know? And what's the difference between being God-like and being a God? or being the god. That's, you know, like that. that's a question that you tackled throughout the franchise. Right, right. Particularly and, with SG-1. Right, and I, and I, and again, it's one of the things I, I particularly love is that I, I don't, I don't by any means uh, suggest I have the answer to anything, you know? And that's, that's what, what it really comes down to is without that knowledge, you know, without that answer, then, you know, let's, let's just explore the possibilities um, creatively, you know, in terms of storytelling. So that, that was sort of where it went.
at the end of the day, you're entertaining people, you know? I mean, well, at the end of the day, you're taking home a paycheck. But I mean, it, it, in the meantime, you know, you're creating something, trying to create something that is going to be of value to other people. And hopefully, after they turn off the television set, we'll make them think a little bit, you know, about the, who am I going to be when I wake up tomorrow, you know, as I become 37.201 version of myself or whatever, right. you know? Right. Yeah, I mean, look, you just also just sometimes reflecting uh, how people choose to live, you know, and, right. and by doing that or or showing what, what a certain character believes in, uh, people can look at themselves and say, yeah, I believe in that or I don't believe in that. You know, sometimes you find a character on TV and you like, you enjoy watching them because they're so completely opposite what you are, mm -hmm. you know, you sort of decide this is who I am in contrast to who that person is. Mm -hmm. Well, there's something to be said for watching people carry out actions that, you know, you and your own little fantasies. Well, wouldn't it be interesting if I did this? I think it's one of the reasons why Breaking Bad is so successful is because we see someone starting off in one place and d devolving into something else while we're watching him just delude himself, you know? Right. Um, yeah. There's all kinds of, we can unpack that. Oh, that. absolutely. Uh, I'm going to skip over a couple of my other questions because I think it makes sense to go to the Ori at this point. You know, okay. with Atlantis, we talked about about where they where the ancients or the whatever they were called, were called at that point in time, millions of years ago, went, which was Pegasus. And then you guys got into bonus territory by Sci-Fi Channel saying, eh, season eight was pretty good with Atlantis. Let's do another one. And you almost rebranded it, Stargate Command. But you had to tell something next, and that was ended up being, where did they come from? Yeah, I mean... And who were and their brothers and sisters? That, yeah, look, not that I'm going to... I'm not blaming anyone here. This is just circumstance. But um, the fact was that that Richard Dean Anderson wanted to sort of pull back, right? Mm -hmm. he, didn't, he didn't want to work full-time anymore. And, and, uh, and so we were losing a... Uh, a major piece of the puzzle and and uh we talked a lot about um just starting another show mm -hmm. you know like there was i'm sure the fan the the diehard fans know there was talk of, of rebranding the show stargate command um and not continuing on with sg1 at the end of the day we felt like we were keeping enough of the old elements uh you know it's, it sounds wrong to call them the old elements, the the core elements. Let's say uh, uh, that 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 you know. I think the success of the show over the over the long haul was the fact that we were willing to reinvent the show. We were, you know, Daniel went away and you know, and then came back, and uh, we would bring in you know new villains. We would change up the world. It just that's that's what kept going yeah no uh, uh ben browder compared it to mash yeah and uh um so so yeah i mean i think i you know i think ben and, and claudia came in and added a, a whole new refreshing dynamic um uh, created a different chemistry with the team another another good chemistry like a different one but but just had a, a different energy and electricity to it and and i felt like we needed new villains like we had just you know we had defeated the ghoul too many times and and to such a great extent that they were no longer really a a threat although i did love the way that the the sort of they sort of stayed alive in the world, you know. They yeah, sort they of, evolved. Yeah. They had no choice. They had to evolve themselves. The Stragglers kind of formed this this ghouled resistance, yeah. right? Um, but the next evolution of what I felt was the spiritual storyline was, you know, okay. Now we had explored the idea of these super powerful godlike benevolent beings the ancients what if there was a bad version what if there were what if there was a bad what if somebody you know that whole idea of absolute power corrupts you know absolutely and yeah. what if there was what if somebody you know kind of got a little too carried away 
with the possibilities. Because um, the ones that we knew were not interference, but what if there were others who were? Right. And and then and and also like the 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 gold as you know as God imitators were um we're doing so you know obviously out of out of uh power and 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 but it was there was something practical about it right there was there were the these were these were their armies these were the people who built their pyramids and 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 did work for them i mean the idea of well what if there was a direct connection between spiritual worship and the power of that godlike being that felt like an evolution to me and and you mean the direct energy transfer that became yeah, apparent in like, yeah Fourth Horseman. Of, essentially like a an energy a, a massive energy vampire up in the sky you know sucking your devotion out of you um felt like a a really insidious uh evil and and also again you know in this case created an enemy that was frighteningly powerful. Like, like I felt like you started season nine with the idea of, of, oh my God, you know, yeah, we're superheroes. We've, we've, we've rid the galaxy of the gold. We can do anything. Oh, wait a minute. These guys are really a problem. How are we ever going to defeat them? Like that, that felt like the challenge that needed the gauntlet that needed to be laid down is, is to kind of reset the world so that our heroes looked like they were in trouble and that mm -hmm. there was a challenge that, that was, they were facing that might be insurmountable. Daniel um, says it I, for the first time. Yeah. He tells Jack, I'm truly scared. Right. He's gone mano a mano with them. He once was one of them, one for of quote unquote. Them. Right. What, whatever they right. had the potential to be. And right. you're answering um, more uh, of what you're seeing with 9-11 in many respects. You know, the, the world is aware now, uh, much more aware of, of people like the United States. We certainly became more aware of people beyond our borders and of, and of possible, possible threats. Not to say that the OIR, the Taliban, or anything else. That's not what I'm suggesting. But I mean, it was, it became much more contemporary. I think, yeah, I think that um, unfortunately, you know, again, and we see this happening more and more today is that race and religion are, are, are things that are separating us instead of bringing us together. And, and that's a problem. I mean, mm -hmm. we, I think what the Ori was a much more a, um, you know, again, an evolution of the, the sort of the problem with, I think, blind, you know, faith in a way. And, and that what blind faith that, that also uh, potentially harms others around us. And that's, that that was sort of I mean I I don't I, I didn't really draw a connection to to 9/11 or any one specific oh, okay. it, it was never it was never one specific type of faith or or denomination or any or any type of like you know um, you know terrorism or anything like that okay. it was really more about uh, the flip of a super the other side of the coin of a super powerful what if a super powerful godlike you know creature uh or entity broke bad you know and yeah. and 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 what would we as mortals you know simple mortals do about that mm -hmm. absolutely uh i i've just got a few minutes uh left with you here this has been fascinating, and I'm going to skip over the content that I had uh, for myself because some fans uh, have wanted to, to reach out and ask a couple of questions here. Um, so Max says, uh, hello from Argentina. Regarding books and comics, uh, were you and Brad involved in anything about what happened to them? Uh, yes and no. I mean, again, we, we were very busy making the show. Uh, <laughs> We definitely uh, wanted the merchandise, you know, the ancillary kind of creative material mm. to 
be up to the standards of the show and reflect the the franchise properly. Um, there were some of the authors that we spoke to of the books at times where they would run the stories by us and, you know, we would kind of comment on what would and potentially wouldn't happen in that universe or in our universe. But a lot of it was, you know, really those people taking off and running with, with something that was sort of outside the mythology of the show. Um, the comics, I can't, and the only time I can speak to specifically um, I did consult quite a bit on the, uh, the universe one that involved the sort of, uh, Telford backstory. Um, that was one where, uh, that was sort of a, we were looking for, again, one of those elements that was there in the mythology, but hadn't mm -hmm. been kind of explored and, and, um, and I felt like that was a great uh, part of the part of the story that could have been that could be unpacked. It was like backstory, but at the same time was was potentially felt relevant. One of the things that people keep on going back and forth about in the uh, in the online threads is the uh, des is the SGU uh, restart comics that find a group of ancients on board Destiny. And everyone's like, is this canon? Is this canon? To my understanding, that was not your intent. Is that right? No. Okay. Okay, that's fair. Uh, Ian wanted to know, was the... Having the Ori never ascend their followers, was that baked into it from the very beginning? They yeah, were being lied to? You don't want to, you know, I mean, when you're a magician, you don't give away your secrets. and <laughs> Especially if the energy output is going to be reduced among all of you. Right. Yeah. Don't, don't don't teach everyone the tricks, right? Yep. This is this is a kind of a big one. Russell asks, of all the episodes that you wrote from SG-1, Atlantis, and Universe, so all of those, um, which ones were you most satisfied with the finished product? Wow. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, I mean... Huh. You first directed Satita, right? Was that your first directorial? No, Crusade, Crusade was my first. Excuse director. me. That's right. I'm sorry. I apologize. No, that's, fine. No, that's uh, correct. That's correct. Uh, yeah. Um, a clip show, nonetheless. Right. Uh, <laughs> a vol clip show. Uh. uh, yeah. I mean, you know, it sounds again. It, it'll sound a little self-serving because because I think the ones I like the most are the ones I also directed. But I think mm. that, and that's not because I. <laughs> think I'm the best director it's because the experience of, mm -hmm. of you know conceiving of the idea and then following it all the way through um to to production and, and also just like I with the with all due respect to the fans mm -hmm. uh and, and who have who 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 obviously um uh, are devoted to the show for the most part, television is very digestible. People watch an hour and then it's over. And it's like they don't appreciate everything that goes into it and, right. and how long it takes to make it and how, frankly, hard it is, although I don't want to whine about it. It's the job. Um, but, but I've come to value the experience more than the final product. Like, I, I feel like the process is what I enjoy and take away. And, and so, so when I look back on them, you know, my answer about, well, creatively, what's the most satisfying versus the ones I remember the most as being, you know, the most enjoyable things I've done in my career. Um, I think the answer is a little different. Right. Uh, you know, for me, uh, Vegas, you know, was just, yeah. Uh, so much fun. And all the cameos from, yeah, Charlie Cohen to Joel Goldsmith to Ivan everything rolling about, the dice. Everything about it was fine. I mean, I know fans complain about the penultimate episode being alternate reality and everything, but I, I just, <laughs> it was a, it was a, it was a blast to do. Uh, the two longest days I've ever shot consecutively. It was insane. Like we did a, I think a 17 and a 19 oh hour day or day back to back. It was, it was crazy. Um, and, you know, just flying by the seat of our pants, yeah. you know, doing huge stunts. We actually lost the A camera footage on the main stunt where the 
you know, Wraith jumps off the roof of the planet Hollywood. Um, it wasn't, yeah, the, the th ran out of tape. I want to talk about with that with you in the future. So, yeah, it was film, actually. We were shooting 35 millimeter yeah. film. How that camera operator couldn't hear the film run out when his ear was right beside the mag, I don't know. But anyway, yeah. uh, that one, um, Time, uh, you know, which, yes. uh, which I, you know, still sort of look go back to and watch and go yeah that 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 kind of holds up you, um, you've done some if i may insert you, you had done so many time travel stories at that point it's ridiculous not to mention so many episodes yeah right never and so you know i'm watching this and i had not seen butch cassidy um so i didn't get the the line of dialogue and then i didn't understand the ending right away and about five minutes after it i'm like yeah i get it i get the the story that he's trying to tell but then, i love I loved the fact that so many people were like, I can't believe they didn't do part two. Like, no, what's you know, but what? like part two is built in. We, right. The whole story is complete, you know, and it's a circle. I woke up the next day and I was like, that was really interesting. It's like, you know, if, if there are three, if there are three passes to this, to this particular moment in time, let's tell the second one and infer the third. I mean, that, that just blew my mind when I realized that yeah. that's what you had done. Yeah, and so, and you know, again, that that show. When I think about it, when you when you, it, it, at the time, you always kind of you get notes or you you know you come up with an idea uh, that that it, maybe it is initially flawed or derivative or whatever, and then someone says something and you you think, oh, all right, I'm I'm going to compromise, but it actually makes it better. Originally, I wanted to do that entire episode from the point of view of the keynote. I mean, from the moment that I pitched the Kino as a concept uh, for universe. Um, it was in my mind that I wanted to do like a Cloverfield type episode that was entirely from the point of view of the Kino. I, when I, somebody then, I think it was the network, somebody at the network said, we don't want you to do the entire episode that way. We think, we think it should be kind of interspersed. And that initially kind of really rattled me and I disagreed. <clears throat> but looking back, it's what made that episode, you know, the fact that it was, you know, a dual story it was what was on the Kino versus the reality and people watching yeah, they're it. watching it. They're taking it in. But they're seeing those things. Yeah. That all made, made it work. And, and, and then also when I was actually directing those scenes, it was like, I can't imagine trying to do this entire, like the limitations I created for myself by having it only be a static floating ball is the camera <laughs> i have, <laughs> I have like, i'm somewhere. so happy they gave me that note uh oh, there it is there's my keynote right there that's one oh, of the screen yeah. used brilliant. ones brilliant <laughs> that one uh and then uh uh malice you know just mm. again the experience of going out there into the desert with everybody the Bisty badlands i've been Bad it's amazing. It's a phenomenal place but it was just like you know it's that that summer camp feeling where you're kind of uh, sequestered together, you're staying in the same motel and, you know, all eating together. And it's just, it's, it was, it was just so much fun. Um, uh, those experiences and, and, you know, and then I think the episode that kind of came out of it was, was, was pretty good, but those, those were the ones that sort of really stand out in my mind for, for those reasons. I mean, there are, you know, ones that I wrote, um, uh, that are, that are also special to me, but I guess the, the, I always go back to the experience of making it. Would you be interested in being involved in the next Stargate series that Brad is pitching? Uh, we just, sure. I mean, I, I haven't really had any conversations with him specifically about it. He told me he was working on something, but I okay. have no idea what the idea is. Um, but, uh, I mean, look, I, it's somewhat shocking to me that there hasn't been more activity in trying to right? get the off the ground. Um, uh, if anything, you would think this franchise, you know, would warrant it, would, you know, deserves it. Um, what it should be. I mean, that's a whole other conversation. I mean, look, I know, I know there, there was, uh internally you know within mgm a bunch of talk because um you know emmerich was making mm. uh uh the 
Independence Day movies there and that 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 there was certainly um, some development that was happening about future new Stargate movies, I think, uh, which were keeping them from from pursuing the series. Mm -hmm. I don't think I, I mean, I don't I don't I really don't know. I don't think that's uh, in the way anymore. No, Brad's definitely in talks. Uh, he posted on Twitter working on it. So, well, look, I mean, it's uh, it's nothing's real till it's real. Right. It's true. Rob, this has been fantastic, and I hope you've enjoyed this process as much as I am, as yeah, I have. Great. Yeah, you're awesome. You're a terrific uh, interviewer, and uh, I've enjoyed it. I hope the fans enjoy it. I would love to have you back. Uh, if, if you'd be interested, uh, I'd love to have you back before the end of the year to talk more. Um, the, the, uh, the, the interest of the show that we're worth, the, the Dial the Gate is... Um, has blown me away and people are like give me more please so this this kind of joe rogan style long form podcast yeah. is is working yeah i love it i mean i love listening to them uh and um you know i don't necessarily find myself all that interesting but uh hopefully <laughs> your <laughs> your uh your viewers do the other i mean look i'd love to come back and just uh, we could talk we could talk almost for two hours about heroes and that, <laughs> i that i would, would love that other, I mean, that would be the other one if I go, I mean, I didn't direct that one, but that would be the other one that, that I, it had so many fascinating behind the scenes yeah. uh, things that went into it as well. I mean, that show episode came, episodes came about in such an unusual way. Um, uh, so yeah, there's, there's a ton to talk about there. And that's one that I also feel, you know, again, if I look back and say if there's a episode earlier on that I, uh, I really respect how it turned out was that one the performances are extraordinary the the guest cast I mean, from terrell to saul to everybody it's at the top of my list if we if if and when we get to talk again so, robert picardo in this space. robert picardo in one day man yeah. just stellar absolutely mr robert c cooper everyone i am over the moon it was one of the reasons that I wanted to do this show were to, was to talk with uh, the likes of Brad Wright and Rob Cooper, Jonathan Glassner, who I'm, I'm still trying to get in touch with. The, these people are the people who created this franchise and made it what it is and the reason that we keep on coming back to it. So I, I had a whole lot more questions for Rob than I could get to. A lot more about Atlantis um, and some about uh, heroes as well. Um, that we were we were beginning to talk about heroes. One of the reasons that it was both in, in our forefronts was I had I had written out some questions for heroes. So I would love to have Rob back. This was fascinating. Before I let you go, and before we move on to Andy Frizzell in the next segment, I had really like you and to and invite you to click the like button it makes a tremendous difference with youtube's algorithm and will definitely help the show grow its audience please also consider sharing this video with a stargate friend and if you want to get notified about future episodes click the subscribe icon if you plan to watch live in the future, I recommend giving the bell icon a click so you'll be the first to know of any schedule changes with the live guests. Both of these episodes today were pre-taped. Uh, bear in mind, clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next several days on both the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. That's all I've got for you for this episode. Thanks once again to Mr. Robert C. Cooper for joining us. Andy Frizzell is up next, and I will see you on the other side. <laughs>